Hi, thank you very much for joining us. This is another session, a roundtable discussion uh, called Making Sense. And I have David Arabak uh, and Dana and Michelle Connell. Um, and I really love doing this. This is an opportunity for us to take sometimes subjects that are not well talked about or very often talked about, and we talk about what they mean for you and your portfolio. And um, I have three experts here, along with myself, that can discuss just about any investment subject that comes along. And today, what I'd like to do is start off with the large cap financial stocks. As interest rates drop, um, what do you think is going to happen to those uh, particularly? And Michelle, why don't we start with you? Um, I'm kind of looking at it in a barbell approach. There's some names in the the big financial space or the big bank spa space that look good. Um, I do like Bank of America. That looks interesting here, especially with Warren Buffett dumping or selling as many shares as he has. And that's pushed down the price, not a lot, but a, a little bit. It pays a good dividend. And at the same time, I also like Chubb, which Buffett has been acquiring. And we've had such a bad start to the hurricane season already and those names can do well also so what do you what do you think about the investment banking division of bank of america because i know that jp morgan came out and said that that was going to be their big windfall was going to be the investment banking do you see that for bank of america as well i think it could be an issue for them also um i do some work uh for my clients hold some venture cap or some private, you know, holdings. And a lot of them had been looking at going public at the beginning of the year. That is now because of the uncertainty with the economics been pushed out maybe to 2026. So I think that could be a, a bit of a problem, but I, I like bank of America. I think they run a clean or organization uh, versus Wells Fargo is having issues again, uh, JP Morgan is always great, but it's still expensive. So I'm picking good and cheap. So the idea of interest rates dropping, how does that help a bank, Dana? In theory, it means that uh, the cost of your capital is declining. And uh, while the cost of your the price you can get for the loans may fall a bit, hopefully it, it doesn't fall as fast. The problem for the banks when money started costing money a few years ago was that they were holding their capital in very long-term federal notes, and they were getting very little interest from it, uh, and yet they were having to pay more to customers for their money, and you know, they were losing they were losing a lot of money that way. Now that interest rates are going down, you'd think that would reverse. Problem is that banks are not where the money is anymore. Um, big companies, they don't put their money in the bank. Uh, most of the, the, the only bank that I could think of buying at this point is Visa, the credit card company. Um, they were a spun, spin out of Bank of America. Uh, uh, years and years ago. And that's where money is actually moving. And that's where you have a loan spread. I mean, they, they sell money at 20, 25% interest rate, and they're getting it for, for practically nothing. It's, it's impossible to lose. They don't have offices. Um, that's, that's a good business. That's what bank used to be. But generally, I don't think banks, unless they're trading companies like Morgan, like Bank of America, I don't see it. And uh, David Arabak, you you come at this from a unique position on real estate. Um, where what banks and what do you think about the financial services industry with interest? Say, before I touch on the real estate angle, when I think about wearing my Wall Street hat as a uh, fund manager and dealing with these banks and these publicly traded REITs, I think it bodes well for a lot of these investment banks because of the fact that REITs. The cost of borrow, as Dana mentioned, goes down. You know, companies like that you read on all the covers of the deals, if somebody does a secondary offering or a forward equity sale or a new debt, uh, debt issuance, it's going through, you know, the big bulge bracket firms, the JP Morgans, the Citibanks, 
Goldman's, you know, these guys, as far as on that side of the investment banking equation, their phones are going to be ringing off the hook here, I think, starting next week or in the next couple of weeks. So from that side of it, I think it does bode well for the big banks. Obviously, from a real estate perspective, it plays into it. Lower rates, lower cost to borrow. The sector becomes more attractive. They're going to be wanting to do more dealing using some of these counterparts. It may lead to some increased M&A inside the sector uh, since um, um, activism and um, deal making has been alive and well, especially with Blackstone taking a couple of REITs private over the past couple of years that I do see there being synergies between the rate cuts, the relationships with the bank business and the appetite for growth. So Michelle, let's talk about other sectors or indices that are gonna do well or maybe not do very well as interest rates drop. So let's focus in on the small to mid cap sector, um, which I know brings in lots of different industries as well. Um, so it's very hard to, to kind of brush stroke through all of them. But what sectors uh, do you like in the small cap and mid cap arena? Well, as we all know, a large portion of the Russell 2000 are unprofitable companies and also highly leveraged. So I like those that are profitable. They're out there. Uh, but currently, the profitable small cap have not gotten rewarded this year. Nothing has in the Russell. Something is going to have to change. And when you go back through, go back, back through time and look at small versus large, typically they run in 10 year cycles. We're past the 10 year mark for large caps being the leader. It's been over 12 years. I keep hoping Ed, that small cap will pick up the baton at some point and I've gone to the companies or invested in the companies that are profitable, lower leveraged, or and or in a turnaround status, but it's they still have to be recognized. And right now, the market has not done that. The, we need lower interest rates and belief in a soft landing, both those items, not just lower interest rates, because if we go into a recession, those stocks overall will not do well. What, what do you think the chances of us seeing a recession are? We keep getting more indicators that show us that it's kind of even odds right now between a soft landing and a, uh, an actual recession. Uh, when you see some of the larger employers ha announcing the layoffs that they are, that's what's concerning. I think PwC announced their largest layoff ever today that was on Bloomberg. Things like that are concerning to me. Um, you're starting to see more uh, worry from the, the consumer in terms of potential layoffs. That's going to mean lower spending, uh, especially for middle and lower class. So lower spending, if we have less spending, the economy is not going to do as well. Maybe it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. So I think it's something that really bears uh, watching, and that's obviously what the Fed's doing now, right? They've they're not watching inflation as closely; they're watching the labor numbers, and that's what we need to be watching as well as investors. And uh, Dana, why don't you talk about the small and mid cap arena and what you see happening as interest rates start to ratchet lower? I agree that. When it comes to uh, small and mid cap, it, it's a stock picker's market. Uh, you're only going to uh, be looking for the guys who are actually making money and growing. Um, Ava, uh, which is the Mediterranean Chipotle, is one example. Uh, I bought Corning recently. Um, the old uh, Corning Glass Company makes fiber optic cable, which is going to be heavily used as more and more data centers become get rid of their copper and, and, and go entirely with fiber. Uh, and um, I also like Lineage, which is, a, um, they operate cold warehouses. They just declared the dividend. Excuse me. They're a free. So they have to, you know, uh, give you the dividend. Uh, and uh, that's another one. That's that make money. Uh, 
they're there. Uh, you have to you have to find them, and when you see them, you find. Them. And what do you think the chances of a recession are? It, if we get one, it'll be it'll be relatively mild. That's what the market is saying. Uh, the market keeps on going up. I mean, uh, how can you be that worried about a recession if if it's still buying? Everybody's buying right now. Um, the the problems with that they thought they had with the biggest cap names um, seem that seems to have gone away. Um, we're near records, uh, so the market is saying no recession. And the Fed has plenty of dry powder that they can use if they see things going pear-shaped. Uh, right now, I'm more worried about actual deflation. I was surprised the inflation number was as high as it was. Uh, have you been to the gas station lately? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what you're paying for gas? You're paying less than $3 a gallon for gas. Uh, that filters through to everybody who uses it. Um, Natural gas has been below two for ages. Um, and I don't think it's going back up. Uh, more and more, the only energy that I worry about is electricity. And in that area, we really just need a lot more investment in our utilities. Fortunately, I think Berkshire Hathaway's on top of that. I, I keep on, people keep on asking, what? What's Warren Buffett going to do with all of this hundreds of billions of dollars he's accumulating? I suspect he's going to buy utility. Um, his insurance guy is cashed out, but he's still got the utility guy. And they are one of the biggest electric utilities out there. There's a huge opportunity in, um, in that in area of infrastructure right now. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Berkshire Hathaway sees it because it's something that can continue to be a big opportunity for them without Warren. He is 94. You know, both you and Michelle talk about Warren Buffett. I I actually have done some analysis on Warren Buffett's returns, and mm -hmm. he's a mediocre investor when mm -hmm. you since 1996. Um, but everyone holds him out as you know this you know incredible investor. The the genius behind Warren Buffett is that he stayed invested and he stayed invested for a long period of time. But if you look at his risk return, it's not that much better than the S&P. And you don't have to be. Uh, you can make a lot of money by being just a little bit better than the S&P if you stay in the market. I and mean, this is what we tell clients all the time. Stay in it, stay in it. Don't, don't get in and out. Don't take small gains. Just stay with it. Don't panic. Yeah. So, so David Auerbach, why don't you uh, jump in on the conversation about small and mid cap uh, stocks, even though that's not your expertise, but I'm sure you've done some homework in it. Well, first of all, props to Dana for mentioning lineage, which is the largest REIT by terms of market cap out there in the universe. The yield isn't that real sexy on it compared when you think about small cap names and stuff, but mm -hmm. love the REIT pick there. You know, uh, Ed, we run small and mid-cap ETF. Our, 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 our high dividend yield ETF, RIET, is mostly comprised of small and mid-cap REITs and mortgage REITs, which would also kind of fall in that camp as well. So we follow this every single day. We kind of take a different approach because it, uh, it hammers home a little bit on both what Michelle and Dana said. When you think about leverage and how it impacts some of the small cap guys and they're kind of upside down because of the market cap size, for our fund, we've been agnostic because we look at the REITs that pay the highest dividend yields or the highest dividends with the lowest leverage ratios. We lead debt first kind of for our stance because of all the concerns with the debt markets, especially when it comes to the world of REITs. Number two, we've seen just in the past couple of weeks, 20 different companies in my little world raise several billion dollars or more, if not more, of new debt capital, and by and large, everything has had a 5% handle on it. And even if the Fed cuts interest rates 25 basis points next week, 50 to that very small camp that's out there, but I think pretty much the, the, the general consensus is going to be 25, you know, I don't think it's going to have that incremental of an impact when it comes to the lending window. It's not like 
suddenly the cost of borrow goes down 50 basis points or more for these companies. I think it's going to be a de minimis impact. Same thing on the mortgage rates as well for all the home builders and stuff, all the guys that are trying to buy houses right now. I don't think it's going to be an overnight 50, 100 basis point reset just because the Fed cut 25. But from the world of small and mids, at least for where we sit, it's it's all about earnings growth. Regardless of, because everybody's been talking about this higher for longer, or higher for longer. Well, now it's just high for long. And how do you operate in a high for long environment? Even if they cut 50 basis points from here until the end of the year, we're still high. So how do you continue to operate in this environment when things aren't really going to change, hopefully, until 25? One other point, the recession thing, I, I, you know, I'm kind of in the same camp as what uh, Dana and Michelle said. But, Ed, I know you – shoot. I know you go to Vegas from time to time. I got excited. I knocked off my computer here. Sorry. Um, have you seen – the table rates are if you try to go play blackjack at a table if you see what room rates are at the hotels have you try, uh you know book an airfare ticket you know there's the costs are up meanwhile vegas gambling numbers continue to rise people are going to las vegas and droves the sphere the new venue that's out there is putting up ridiculous numbers right now for the handful of events that they've had there so far and so i don't want to hear talks about recession when people are going to Vegas and spending this lack of income or there's no spending that's out there, but yet they're leaving it in Las Vegas. So, so, you know, David, you said something about where rates are, you know, absolute number, but the genius of investing is recognizing the direction of trends. And, and as long as they change the trend to lower rates, that's going to be a stimulation for everything. Um, you know what because, they say, the trend's your friend, right? Yeah. Exactly. So speaking of trends, you know, it's obvious I'm not a small person. And I went on this GLP um, uh, Manjaro, and it I'm probably the only person it hasn't impacted at all. I'm just as hungry as I've always been. But so and one of the other subjects that we have for today are the GLP um, recommendations and a few promising names in the sector. Which names do stand out for, for you guys when it when you're looking at future growth and uh, for stock prices? Michelle? Well, I'm going to go with, first of all, I've got the one of the tried and true, the uh, Norvo looks, continues to look interesting and they're adding on more capacity. Um, a lot of individuals don't like the cost. That's why they're going with Lily because Lily has undercut them at least temporarily, that may change. Um, but at the same time, I've been speaking to some physicians and physicians assistants in the North Texas area. A lot of them are using what are being called these compounds, which mm -hmm. are cheaper, but they're starting to notice side effects with those. If I was a doctor or a PA or physician's assistant, I'm going to stick with the tried and true names even if they're more expensive, because if you get blowback with more side effects, which were starting to come out, because as you said, so many people are on this stuff. I, if I were them, and that's what they were telling me, they want to stick with Norvo and Lily. That being said, I've also done some interesting reading on a company in San Diego that's coming up with their own call compound don't know anything about the price of the stock yet. Just ran in it today called Viking. Yep. Viking yep. therapy. Yeah. They have a, um, they're working on a, a pill soon. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Because right now, the only way you get these drugs is you have to inject it into yourself. It's not a lot of fun. Uh, if you can just take pill every day, that is going to change the industry. And Viking is not the only company that is, working in this direction. Lots of people are. Uh, a lot of small private companies are working in this direction. And if they get even close, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see a, a Pfizer or one of them or Merck, you know, snap them up really fast. Uh, do they have to get good uh, phase two trial? Um, probably not before they're gonna be out priced out of the market, even for, for Pfizer. We've seen what happened the values of these companies 
when they do have something in this area that work and um, they just skyrocket that lily is as a stock is incredibly expensive so is nova um that's why so piling into viking is probably well not piling in but you know put a little a little something something over there uh yeah. you might win. viking has been a takeover candidate for the yeah. past six months because they've yeah. hit their different clinical trials but they're also not in a great financial shape uh which yeah. is typical you know you get these biotech companies that do great things and then they start to get you know strapped for cash and then a big multinational or you know comes in and buys them up and uh and then expand their network so they're uh, looking yeah so david your comment I'll give, you two, I'll give you two plays on that from where i sit first of all it's alexandria real estate or alexandria labs they do life science so all the companies that you guys have mentioned are their tenant. All of the lab space where they develop these products are in one of these properties owned by Alexandria. The ticker is ARE. And the other way to play it is through a company called Health Peak. Their ticker is DOC, D-O-C. They own medical office, coast-to-coast -coast medical office buildings. So if you want to go in and get that uh, prescription, you got to go to the doctor's office, which probably is owned by one of these medical office building REITs such as health peak so ticker doc that's two i personally like the i like both plays honestly um but i think with the with um still a lot of diseases and things out there as we're on the hunt for cure like the cure for cancer among other things you know it's not going to happen by way of a zoom conversation or chat gpt they're not going to figure it out it's going to be in one of these life science lab white space type buildings so alexandria could be a good angle to pursue it that's an interesting perspective on on uh, the uh, GLPs. So um, so today, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you know all three of you doing this, and anyone watching this, please you know sign up uh, to receive these uh, directly from us. Uh, and uh, I really thank you very much for doing this, everybody. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you.